Hi guys, uh, I'm really delighted to be here, particularly with you, Bao, but um, I'm also really happy to be back at Reba because uh, since I was last here, which I think was maybe six months ago or so, uh, with my wife and children, I've moved to New York uh, to launch Pepe in the USA, which has been hugely exciting for us. Um, so I'm back here in my hometown for the week uh, for Reba, which is, which is lovely. Um, for those of you that don't know what Pepe do, we provide, uh, we're a healthcare company that provides support for kind of underserved areas of health. I think we're probably most well known uh, for kind of inventing menopause support about four years ago. Uh, we also do fertility support, perinatal support, and then support for uh, women's health and men's health more generally. And that's where we cover things like uh, endometriosis, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, and things like that. And if you don't know what they are, they're a big deal and they affect uh, a lot of your workforce. I am thrilled to be here with you, Val. Um, actually, I'm going to pass you, Val, to introduce yourself. You can, you can do it better than me, but Val is the talent director uh, for Northern Europe from Capgemini and a bit of a superstar. So, Val, over to you. Hello. Lovely to be here with you all today. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Max has just introduced me. I am the talent director for North Central Europe for Capgemini. Been at Capgemini for about 16 years. They make it incredibly hard to leave. I'm going to say that. Um, really keen to share what we're doing. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, so today we're going to be looking at how Capgemini is in, sort of strengthening uh, the employer brand using healthcare benefits. So um, I think let's just dive straight in, Val. I think people want to hear from you, not me. So firstly, why is DEI a priority for you guys? Okay. Um, Look, I'm not going to go through all the kind of, there's plenty of studies that have been done out of there that says it's good, good for business, um, diverse workforce, you get increased productivity, it's important for growth. So, so yes, plenty of studies have been done there, but for us, the reality is it is expected by people today. Society expects this from their employers. Our people tell us this is important to them. They want to work for an inclusive organisation. And... I often have new joiners reaching out to me saying, Val, um, I had a number of offers and we chose Capgemini because of what some videos that I have seen or colleagues that they'd spoken to and, and they're making decisions based on that where they connect between large organisations, it can end up being a, much of a muchness. So these kind of things do, do make a difference to them. So it's helping us to attract talent as well. Amazing. So you're saying this is kind of one of the levers you're pulling to get the best people? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know everyone says it's the right thing to do. There's plenty of business benefits to gain, gain from it as well. Amazing. Okay, so secondly, what are you doing, I mean, to sort of increase what you're doing in this area? So you've got a, a kind of baseline, but what, what are the new initiatives that are pushing in this area? I don't think we've got enough time for that, to be honest. Share um, some, share I some, share some. If I talk about it from a macro level, okay, I think it's very important that any organisation needs to have a very clear vision as to what it is that you want to achieve. So for us, we revisit it every year, and we might tweak it, but in, in essence, it stayed the same. We want anyone that works with us, whether it's our employees, our clients, our suppliers, our partners, to really feel that we're a truly inclusive organisation. So you're kind of valued for what you do, empowered to be your best, and really respected for your individuality. So that's kind of what we're striving towards. Um, we have a strategy in place to help us underpin that, and we run it like a culture change program. So it's got all the rigor, governance, and structure behind it in the way that we would any other priority. And the third element is measurement. And so it's quite interesting. We're just following, um, you know, the, the, the previous organisation. I can't under, I can't emphasise enough how important measurement is. So yes, diversity data. How diverse is your workforce? Um, but you could have a really diverse work workforce, but not everyone has the same experience there. So the inclusion experience, measuring that is so important. And then thirdly, I would say um, it's about assessing yourselves externally as well. So I wanted to put ourselves out there for every benchmark going. On one hand, yes, I'm very competitive. Um, the, but the real reason that um, I wanted us to put, put ourselves out there is... At the end of the day, if we're not good in a certain space, at least we know, and we know which direction we need to travel in. And we need to be able, we should be able to be vulnerable ourselves to be able to do that. Um, and I have to say, so we've been a Times Top 50 employer for the last six years, which is great. So best employer for women. Um, 
And it was actually through that process we got feedback. So it's great. So it's really nice that we have this sustained um, position. It was through that process, though, three years ago, when we were having our feedback session. It's nice getting lots of nice feedback. The one area that we weren't kind of up to par when it came to our competitors and the market in was what we were doing around women's health. And that's where our relationship actually, that was a trigger point for us. So it's really important to participate in those kind of activities because it will help identify the gaps in the organisation. Amazing. So you took an approach which is let's share everything publicly to sort of create some sense of accountability for your, for your own team, are you saying? So to participate in these benchmarking exercises, share what it is that we're doing, how we're performing. And because you can feel like you're doing well yourselves, it's nice if your employees are saying nice things, but this is an area that you really can't stand still on. The world's changing around us, we, we, you know, we know that. We need, you, this helps you to kind of raise the bar for yourselves year on year as well. Amazing, thank you. So, uh, why is health support a focus for you guys at Capgemini? And how does that feed into your broader uh, DE&I strategy? Okay, so I've just given one example from the Times Top 50. So that was an area that was identified externally, independently, as an area that we needed to do more on. Health has been important to us for a long time, I think it's fair to say. I don't think we can still have any sessions like this where we don't mention the dreaded pandemic. The pandemic did accelerate the focus on, on health within organisations. Um, we, at the time, we have a monthly pulse survey globally, so we've got just over 350,000 employees globally at Capgemini. We're in over 50 countries, and we introduced um, pulse questions during the pandemic, asking to check in on people's well-being from a mental health point of view, from a physical well-being point of view, were their managers supporting them, and those are the kind of things that that now is one of our key points for. Um, how we measure our employee experience at Capgemini now. So it started there as, a, as an interim process. That is one of our main, kind of main ways of we're measuring kind of well-being right now. Amazing. And so suddenly you've got this pulse, which I guess goes up and down. Um, and the danger, I guess, bless when you start you. asking... Bless you. Yeah. Yeah. The danger when you start asking these questions is you, you have to act on things. Don't you? So what have you learned from these pulses and how have you responded to, to them? So, for example, you could, you could see in certain regions or there was a lot of great feedback for what we were doing from a mental health point of view. So that was a journey we started on about six years ago, raising awareness around mental health. Um, when it came to things like leadership commitment, we were getting great scores. Then we weren't getting, at one point, great scores from a manager point of view. So, so the question was, you know, is, is my manager asking me questions about my well-being? And this was during the pandemic. So what we've done, so, we, so again, it was, a, it was a really tough time, wasn't it? Yeah, through that. So it's again, how could we then support our managers who, to A, look after themselves and look after their teams? Well, we were pretty much working remotely overnight. So again, so we built that into our education. So, so we have something that we have partnered with Harvard University on. And we've adapted that, that curriculum now to make sure that we are building in that well-being part so it's part of the, the education that we give to our managers. That's, that's one example. Amazing. Um, and just, obviously, what's nice is if you can share some things that are helpful for people. I mean, I think Capgemini is pretty well-known as someone who's doing well in this space. So what are a couple of takeaways that people can hear, can just put in their pocket and maybe roll out at their own organisations? <laughs> if they're not already doing them, I'm sure many of you are already I'm sure doing you all of these be. things already. Yeah. I can't emphasise enough around how important it is to ask your people. Don't assume, don't assume what it is that they need or what the kind of, you know, the most kind of latest thing that's being launched in the market. Take time to ask your people what is it that they need support, support in. If you do launch something new, take time to, to get feedback that, as to whether it's working. I know on one hand, yes, you can look at participation. Some of the things that we've we've launched, um, if I focus on inclusion from a women's health point of view, I'm really proud to share that we launched fertility assistance this year. And I just found out last week we've got our first employee in the UK that has been, is now pregnant as a result of it. So... <sighs> 
challenging. I, I, I mean, I've been through multiple rounds of IVF myself. Um, I know it's utterly unpleasant, so I'm very yeah. happy for your for your employee. That's a a nice a nice milestone. I'm sure it's uh, yeah it's a journey. Let's just uh, yeah. say that. And uh, what's actually interesting whenever you talk about these topics is I know lots of you will have had similar experiences in this room because. Every time I'm at a dinner party and I tell my story, suddenly I realise everyone else has the same story. So, uh, yeah, I know this is something that affects a lot of us. Yeah, but um, when we talk about numbers, but that one for us, I just think that investment's been really worth it. Yeah, it's it's it's. I could go on all day about this, but um, it's it's such a challenging thing to go through and to feel that your employer supports you is is a is a significant thing. So, yeah. No, that's great. Um, look, I guess one thing that you know you mentioned before the pandemic. I think we've all heard enough about the pandemic. Uh, I certainly have. But there have been some things that have just changed permanently. Um, most obviously, I guess the way we work. You know, many of us now work from home or in a hybrid fashion. It's just, it's just shifted things. Um, you know, for a, you know, we're a relatively small company. You're an enormous company of three hundred and fifty thousand people. <laughs> You've got different challenges than, than we do as a company of 250 people. Um, what is it that you've learned through that? Um, how do you kind of navigate that, uh, for want of a better word? Okay. I think the first step is just accepting that there is no clear line between home lives and work life. I think historically we've always tried to keep you know, our professional lives and our personal lives separate. And the world is changing. The pace at which the world is changing, you know, has really accelerated, you know. And if you think about it, just think about your own personal lives, your journey from when you wake up in the morning to how you're getting to here today, the role technology has played in that. So the way technology is influencing the way you live, if I think about it from um, our employees' perspective, they have different demands and expectations of us. So with change, comes different demands and expectations, and you've got to make sure you continue to evolve yourselves um, to make sure you can continue to, A, that you're aware that these demands and expectations have changed, and you know what they are. So the, just some practical examples that I would, that would give you all that we've done. So I've talked about our manager training, for example. So I'm sure you've all got this in place, but put that hybrid working lens on it or that, that remote working lens. What is it that managers need to be doing differently now? How do you spot the signs of poor mental health remotely? What is it those kind of team rituals that you would have naturally done if you were in the office? How do you continue to do those remotely? So that's, what, that's one example. The second thing is we have things like, um, I know it's gonna sound really boring, but I promise you it's really made a difference and we've got really great feedback on it. We have a hybrid working charter and it's something that's so simple. It's just got some simple principles, but it's endorsed by a very top leadership because we've all been there when you've been on a call at home and you're dreading either the pet making some noise or a child coming running in or the doorbell going. Cause or your partner running in. <laughs> you know, all, all those things. So we have principles like, just remember, we're, we are a virtual guest in your home, so you don't have to apologise for any background noise. Just those little simple things, encouraging, um, encouraging people. You know those meetings where you're either going to be listening in or it's a one-to-one. -one. Do that whilst taking a walk. So just that some of those, there were some good things, some good practices that we started during the pandemic, and we didn't want to lose those. So um, that was another example. So it's the manager just the principles, and there's something else I'm thinking of, and I can't remember, but I will say it if I... If no worries. Uh, it's really interesting that, uh, what you say there, because I think lots of companies, including our company, have um, a, like a remote-first hiring policy. And we actually were having a discussion yesterday with the, with the leadership team around, are we actually doing this, though? Because it's one thing to say, yeah, you know, we want you to work for us, we want you to work for us, and you can work anywhere, and we're really flexible and everything. But are we then actually stepping back inside the company and saying, OK, when you are working here, you're already working with us, are we actually providing for you in a way that's appropriate for someone who is now working remotely? And I think there's definitely a bit of a gap between you know, what people say and, and the reality of it. So I, I strongly think we need to evoke the, uh, the hybrid uh, well, policy that, that you just talked about. So I remember the third thing, so respect. So I talked about respect being part of our, our vision. Now, respectful and inclusion behaviours Again, when we started this a few years ago, 
a lot of the things that we talked focused on was about being physically together in the same space. So again, we've adapted that now to really think about what does respect look like when you're, when you're working virtually as well. And back to that point, you know, for some people working remotely is a dream, for others it's the worst nightmare. So make sure you have something in place that provides a balance for both, but also doesn't kind of disadvantage people's career progression in any way in terms of that proximity bias, because if you're the person that's always in the office and the other one's working at home, please think about all those things from an inclusion perspective, because we don't want people that are happier staying at home because of whatever personal circumstances to then influence, you know, to have that impact their career. Amazing. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Can I ask you this question very quickly and then we'll go to the audience. Anya, I know you're looking at me. Uh, so I'll make this quick. But um, I think this is really interesting. What's a sign um, that you're actually making positive culture change? Oh. In 30 seconds. Okay. Just open conversations. People are talking about things that they just would not have talked about before. We've got menopause sessions being run. We've got our male colleagues joining with their partners um, because they want to understand how they can better support their partners at home. We're just talking about really important topics that really impact our day-to-day -day lives, like baby loss, in a very open and brave way. And it's the empathy that you're seeing from others. Amazing. I should actually say, so I'm sure you know this, but your colleagues at Capgemini in the United States are about to launch menopause They support. are. First company in the United States. So... Very well done. Um, questions? Does anyone have a question? 